Welcome, everybody, to another live stream. And today, we're going to talk about the next hot thing, which is going to be bike birthing. You've heard it here first. I promise you, within like three months, bikepacking.com will have a guide to bike birthing. And there will be all sorts of brand videos about people doing epic journeys just to follow birds. <laughs> uh, so you guys know I love to combine my different passions while riding a bike. And recently, uh, quite um, and a bit of a surprise to myself as well. I've actually gotten into birding, and I thought I would bring on an expert guest to kind of fill me in a little bit more about birding and all the weird and crazy birding competitions that go on. Uh, also, some tips to bird by bike. But before we uh, meet our guest tonight, I want to thank our Patreon supporters. Thank you so much for keeping all this quirky content coming. That's right. Without you guys, would not be discussing things like bike birding. So thanks a lot. And without further ado, let's welcome our guest, Tony, from the Wildlife uh, Observation Network. Welcome to the show. <laughs> it is an absolute pleasure to be here. <laughs> so Tony, actually, uh, first time we I've, I ran across his name, he actually submitted, uh, he, he entered the contest for the Chris King wheel set. And you, you brought up something that I had no idea even existed, and that's a World Series of Birding. What, what is that exactly? <laughs> so World Series of Birding has been going on over 35 years now and it's a competition in new jersey and a lot of people are like well new jersey right like <laughs> but new jersey if you think about it new jersey has like all the geological provinces of like a state like north carolina but in like a you know a 60 mile wide state by like 200 miles you know top to bottom it's an it's an, an incredibly diverse place it's also a really um it was right on the, on the migration flyway. So it's a really perfect place. It's one of the most legendary places to bird in the world. Huh. So they have this competition in every, uh, every year in May to see. And, and here it's, it's observant. You don't have to see it. You can identify it by song as well or call or what have you. And you have 24 hours to identify as many birds as you can. And there's different categories. There's like a statewide competition, which um, you can you know, use any method of transportation, but everybody drives. And there's also like local ones per to a county. You, all, you could be in one spot. And um, in about 10 years ago, they started to have a competition to, to not use a car. You don't have to use a bike, although it's obviously the best um, <laughs> way to, 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 to do it. And I and so my team, uh, uh, we started competing in the – I did two years in cars, although we used alternate fuels. We did uh, – first year we did um, vegetable oil um an older 80s mercedes of vegetable oil and then the next year we did a um a combination um for the kind of off-road areas we used vegetable oil van and then we switched to a a hybrid because the problem with uh, vegetable oil uh, diesels in general especially old ones are very loud and right. you miss hearing a lot of birds uh because of the noise but then um i decided to 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 go on uh to bicycle and for the and i was going to do it regardless and then just that year they decided to do it as a uh I have a category, the carbon uh, footprint cup. And so we entered the first year and we won that, that first year. In fact, how nice <laughs> still have the, the trophy because nice. uh, a after the first year, um, Swarovski sponsored, sponsored the, uh, the cop, the, the, that particular competition. And so they, they made a nice new trophy. Uh, and so they were like, well, you don't need to give it back uh, because, <laughs> because we have a new one. And so when we won that one a second time, I actually tied for first. Uh, we nice. got to like keep it for a year to bring it back. So yeah, so I had no idea that uh, there is such a thing as competitive birding. Like when you know, there's a I learned about another kind of competition called the Big Year. Can you tell uh, tell me tell uh, viewers about that for those that aren't familiar? Yeah, well, all birding competitions have um, one thing in common is it's, it's the honor system. Okay, all right. It's just no, there's no, um, and it, generally there's no like prize where you could like cheat and. If you cheat, you, you know, you just get bragging rights. You don't get, I mean, sometimes you might get like, if it's sponsored, they might give you free binoculars. But if you're a birder, you're going to already have optics. 
you know, you don't really need a new pair of binoculars. <laughs> and it, you're not going to fabricate, uh, you know, make a whole lie and ruin your reputation if you get caught just to get some, you know, binoculars. Right. Um, so it's a, uh, um, Oh, there's, honestly, not, there's not there's not like bird doping or something. <laughs> no, I mean there there, there there is controversies, and some people think that uh, some people have cheated because, and also, you wishful thinking, you know, especially when it gets down to calls. If you hear, you know, like uh, you can a lot of people use nocturnal flight calls, so a bird will fly over at night. Um, they and they, they most songbirds migrate at night, and they make a, you know, like a, like a or like a, you know, it's right. like a really like. <laughs> And a lot, as some people know those and really know them really well. And, and, but you know, there's only, if there's a few that uh, I know I feel confident with and I feel confident, like, um, let is, you know, we heard it at a competition, you know, um, we would, we would say that like cuckoos are pretty distinctive, sweet and thrush, dick sizzle. We would say, yeah, that's it. But so maybe some people are like fudging that just, there's some, you know, also people are always going to be salty no matter what. Right. But just right. Like people always <laughs> might cheat. People always might be salty and say people cheated, but it's all honor system. So the big year is you pick an, a geographical region. It could be the world. It could be a country. It could be a County. And you, in a calendar year, you try to observe as many birds as you can. And it's been done by bike too. Uh, a friend of mine, Dorian Anderson, he did it. Um, I don't know five or six years ago on a mm -hmm. long haul trucker. In fact, I put him up a night for it. Or actually I, at the time I had a, I was living a bachelor life, but I found him a house around the corner that uh, I, a teammate of mine, he stayed at his house, but I made a dinner and got to know him. We've seen in touch. Um, he did that. And so, yeah. And people, and there was that book and then the movie, the big year. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite uh, burning book is uh, the big twitch, which is uh, Sean Dooley did it a uh, big year in Australia. So people do it all, all different places and, you know, it could be the world. It could be, you know, like I said, like a local area. So, yeah. and again, it's just for bagging rights, you know, <laughs> that's it. That's all it is. There's, there's no like big, like money purse or anything. It's just for, just, just for the sake of doing it. <laughs> no, I mean, like, I mean, you might get like flown to speak somewhere. You might get right. um, <laughs> an optics company might give you free binoculars, you know? Right. Um, that's kind of, you know, and that's not inconsiderable optics, you know, can be um, quite expensive. Yeah, you know? for sure. So yeah. that's, that's always nice, you know, but generally, you know, <laughs> often uh, for the big year, I mean, a lot of people have spent incredible amounts of their own money to do it. So, I mean, oh, you spent, you know, it's 10 to that is you're going to spend 10 thousands of dollars or, right. you know, uh, and lose tens of thousands <laughs> in, in income. And right. oh, you got like. You know, you got a, a you know, a three thousand dollar scope, but a two thousand dollar pair of binoculars. Like it doesn't really bounce. Right. Out, so. <laughs> yeah, I was reading about. Uh, I think the person I won it last year, how much money they spent to do it, and it was close. I, I think it was like about a hundred thousand dollars. A lot of that was yeah. just travel expenses to get to to remote regions. Um, cool. So we've got some people in some in the chat. If you guys are uh, bird nerds in the chat, let us know how you got into birding and what your favorite bird is. Um, I'm curious, Tony, like what, what got you into it? So I, I've been burning since I was nine. I'm 44 now. And, uh, so my, um, I went hunting and fishing with my, my father, my, my mom and camping and whatnot. And we always like nature. I mean, even though I grew up in a city, um, always reading range of Rick and, you know, looking at squirrels and birds. Uh, but there's an environmental center in Philadelphia, Petty Pack environmental center in the, um, guy who's there he's still there 36 years later he when i was there he told me about the belt of kingfisher and i thought it was some exotic bird and he's like no no no, it's it's like where can i see this thing where i have to you can see it right here in the park so the next right. week dad and i went we saw it and that was it and i've been hooked ever since and my dad got into it too in fact um i mean i don't know if i could show you at some point i got a they tattooed on me. My dad and I get matching tattoos <laughs> to commemorate this bird. So I've been burning nice. ever since, you know, I think burning is great because there's, I mean, I like, I like all kinds of animals, not just birds. Uh, and I like plants too. I'm really into plants as well, but you know, birds, there's 10,000 of them. And, and you're any particular region, you can know them all. You can, there's enough of them that you can master them. You can know their songs. You can know them by sight. Um, because they fly, they can make mistakes and show up random places, right? So this mm -hmm. always gives you like a 
a um, element of, you know, like I found the third record for Townsend's Warbler in, in a, a park, you know, that I work in. And it, it, I just work one day. I happen to, <laughs> you know, someone's like, hey, Mr. Tony, there's a yellow bird. And I'm like, oh, who's our first goldfinch? And I was like, that's a Townsend's Warbler. Literally, it shouldn't be any. And they, they live where you live, right? I shouldn't right. see one here, right? Mm-hmm. So, but it, ha- so that's, you know, that's, it, it, you never know what you're going to see. And it so keeps is enough for you to get more like plants. I mean, there's, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of plants right. and, you know, fish and insects and, and, you know, there's only millions of insects. So it's something you right. can, there's enough that you can master, but enough variation where, you know, and like herp, I love herp and I love, you know, but right, you, you might not even see what a herp if you go out, you're definitely going <laughs> to see birds every time you go out. So, right. Right. I think when, uh, you know, like what, what got me into it was, it's kind of by accident. I got sent these binoculars to review, um, put up the review this week. And, you know, for, for just, just for funsies, we brought it on a, a bike tour and it was, you know, I, I, I was surprised at how much I enjoyed using the binoculars, you know, I was spotting fish and different birds. And I was curious about the animals I was seeing. Uh, but one thing that struck me is it's actually kind of hard, <laughs> you know, as, as a complete noob, like you can hear the bird and stare at the tree where you think it's, it's, it's in. But for, for the life of me, like the first couple of days I could, I was hearing the birds, but not, not seeing them. So there was like this element of, of, of skill of being quick, uh, that, that I didn't anticipate. Yeah, it's true. And you're in Montana. If you, if you're out East out here, it's, it's even harder because you know, <laughs> the, the forest is so much denser. It's so much darker here. Uh, yeah. So it's certainly like, it's it. That's in a nutshell. It's like, it's easy to see some birds or hear them. But to actually get on them and like find them and track them and, and yeah, it's definitely a, a challenge. Um, but you get the hang of it once you you know. Eventually, it'll just be like second. You know, you'll you'll see it move. You'll put your bins on it. And you'll you'll see it. It'll be like second nature to you. You know, eventually. Yeah, yeah. I think the one you know we're we're lucky we we live right next to this like little uh, natural area and there's a, a trout creek there. So w- you know when the fish are off, you know I've been bringing the binoculars. And we saw one bird that looked super cute. And, you know, I looked at that, you know, I ID that using Merlin on the phone and it was uh, the American Dipper. I was right? going to say, way- as soon as you said trout fishing, I was like, you, you have to see Dipper. In fact, the first Dipper I saw was, uh, um, I was not in Missoula. Um, I was, we took a day trip from Missoula out to, uh, to the hot springs across the border in Idaho. And I saw okay. him there in the winter. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, like I put the bins on, it's like, what's it doing? And I read about how it like kills its prey. Like it'll take it in its mouth and like bash like the small fish or insect on the rock. I was like, holy cow, it's pretty punk rock. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and it's a song where it actually swims on their water. I mean, yeah. it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of the other things I really kind of help is, is helping me facilitate this journey is uh, the, the Jason Ward series that's on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I love... Uh, I think all the episodes are great. There are a couple that really spoke to me. One of them was when he was interviewing uh, Jonathan Franzen, the, the the writer, and you know he was talking about you know the the birds how they're essentially always in the act of killing something. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. So for something so so cute, like if you actually observe them, you know they're you know they're they're hunting or they're trying to avoid being hunted. Absolutely. And we had we had Jason on our on our cast too. He's okay. Yeah. We uh, recently there was um. Uh, did you hear about Black Birders Week? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, and uh, so the Wildlife Observer Network is there's a, there's a few people involved, but essentially the main, the, the two main people, uh, myself and Taiki James, and Taiki um, and Jason, some others were like the founder of, of, of that week. So we did a whole lot cool. with that. And so, yeah, it, was, it, I, it, it all came about because of the whole um, incident in Central Park with the woman with the off leash dog and. And she called yeah, I read I read yeah. that post on on a on on one. Uh, that's pretty nuts. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's also really it. thought provoking. I mean, things like you know, like I know, like I'm a brown person, and you know, I I'm doing things like cycling, fly fishing, and now getting into birding. And there's definitely a sense of like you know, there aren't you know a lot of you know not not white people doing these activities, and you definitely fish feel like a, a fish out of water at times. Yeah, so. and that's something that like you know, it's very much. Some um something we want to change and we're working on on and yeah. it's 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 yeah, I mean it's I wrote an article, you know, about it and and um you know, based upon my experiences with um because I used to take these young um the teenagers from the city out and you know 
and we got an incident where we took him out and they got um basically they racially profiled at a Wawa on the way down to Cape May. And it's like, right. you know, you're like, yeah, at Cape May, everybody wrote out the red carpet and, and you know, Richard Crosley, who wrote these great field guides and Dave LaPuma, <laughs> who was the director at the time, they were all like, you know, they're showing us around, giving us these great tours, these banning demonstrations. It was awesome. But on the way there, we get, um, you know, they get, you know, followed around and harassed at a, at a Wawa on the way down. It's just, you know, it's, yeah, it's not even necessarily the birding community, I mean, which it does have its own problems. Everything, everybody does, um, right. you, you know. Um, whenever you get enough white people around, it's always going to be <laughs> some problem. Um, but on the way there, you know, it's you can't. It's, so it's not just necessarily you know the burning community. It's what happens when you invite people of color to, um, it, when you know what, the challenges. You know, it, you might not you're, you're in enemy territory on on the way to the burning spot, even if that's a safe place. And often that's not. So it's something. Yeah. That, you know, yeah, that's a weird thing. Like, um, so I reviewed these uh, binoculars and I kind of alluded it to the review. And uh, the one of the things I like about them is that they're very toy like. Yeah. You know, because if you're like a not white person and you're, you know, birthing in suburbia, you know, and you have like these big binoculars that look super tactical, you know, people are going to think the wrong thing. But with this, it looks like you, know, you can't take it very seriously. Yeah. And like subconsciously, I was like, oh, that's that's one of the things I like about it. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, it's but let Yeah. Uh so in the comments, uh let us know if you're into birthing, uh what your favorite bird is. Uh Randall Rupp asks, uh, where did you get that shirt, Tony? <laughs> um so um that's uh my friend Steve in um Arizona. And let me just like try to see if I can pull up his I sh you know I should have anticipated that I li I'm not even joking I literally like ripped open the package and threw it on um like a second ago but my friend Steve in uh um Arizona and um let's see if I can um find uh what is it I mean you could probably hit him up for Instagram yeah um, but uh, you know what if you yeah um it's bothering underscore birds <laughs> so, uh, Bali right. underscore birds. Follow him on Instagram and hit him up, and he can get you one. So yeah, this right. is all the 19 species of corvid, you know, jays and crows <laughs> and, and magpies um, that you can see in uh, in in the United States. Nice. Uh, we got a question here from uh, Andy. Uh, in terms of technique, do you stalk the birds or do you hang out and wait for them to come to you? Like, what's what's your approach? Um, it all it all, it all depends. Generally, um. I'm 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 a very gregarious, talkative person, so I just kind of like usually walk around and and just you know they're not that scared of. I mean the idea that they're good, you're going to scare them away by talking and you know generally you don't have to worry about that unless you're looking for something like a a rail or something you know very uh that's very secretive. Uh, you right. generally just walk around and like you know you just look for movement, listen, um and and, and find them that way. Um, but sometimes you know you are looking for something like you know, Virginia rail or, a, you know, like a leech bittern or whatnot. And you really want to, you know, an owl perhaps and you really want to be quiet and, you know, but that's yeah. almost, sometimes it's almost just the quietness isn't necessarily to scare the bird. It's just so you can hear like a, you know, a, a, the reeds move or something, you know, and just be right. really focused. Yeah. So I'm, I'm still a complete newbie when it comes to, to birds, but I have noticed that there is like particular attention paid to, to warblers. Why are warblers uh, so special? I mean, they're just very, I think it's mostly because there's a good variety of them, there's like 50 some in our region, you know, in North America, North of Mexico, um, there's more, you know, even more farther south, but they, um, they're very colorful and uh, because they're just so strongly migratory that you get, it, you know, they, they come through a migration and out east, it's, it's, you know, we get more of them. You get more hummingbirds. Well, not in Montana, but out west, you get more hummingbirds. We get more warblers. And so, you know, um, it's incredible, like places like Central Park and this is spots in Philly. Like you, you could even be in the middle of Center City and, and you know, in a in May, in the morning in May, you can see, you know, a couple, you can see, you know, a dozen, sometimes 20 some species. This like in and around, you know, in the trees, like around Independence Hall or Central Park or your local right. patch. It's, so it's, you know, they, they move through, they're colorful, they're, um, they're a bit challenging. So I think that's, you know, I mean, I love sparrows, but they're just, you know, they're variations of gray and brown and it's, right. you, know, these, you know, greens, blues and yellow. I mean, most of them have some yellow on them. So, yeah. That's that's my been my biggest challenge. There there seems to be like a large number of uh, smallish brown and gray birds that that are very nuanced. 
Yeah, but I mean, that, but you'll get. You'll, I mean, you'll get the hang of it. You'll start like you know. I I think the most important thing is shape. Okay. Right. More than anything else, it's shape because lighting conditions can make them look different in color. Um, the you know the sexes are you know the are different often, not always, but often. Um, juvenile to adult plumage, they change colors at least you know throughout the year to some degree, some dramatically, some subtly. So, but the shape never changes really. So. That's the most yeah. important thing. So what are like some other like good, good things to key in on a bird when, when you're trying to identify it? <clears throat> um, you know, bill shape. That's okay. an important thing. Um, it's uh, the length of the legs, you know, like the tail, like I said, those things tend to be standard and then um, go for, um, you know, like, does it have wing bars? Does it have an eye ring? You know, those are like the obvious ones. And and be careful. I remember I went down in Peru and I saw Aura Pendula, like these giant like Orioles. And I was like, well, this is easy. It's the one that's half green and half rufous with the yellow on the tail. And then I look at the book and they all have that. It's just the it's just the the, the markings on the bill around the eye is what I tell. I'm like, oh, so yeah. Know, <laughs> yeah, I've noticed like one of the things that that uh that I find similar to birthing uh, that I also like in bikes is, you know, when I go to the bike show, like my head is always looking at components or who it's made or like the type of bike. And um, there's some kind of joy in, in IDing something and just that classification yeah. in your head. And also, you know, when you spot something like special rare, like a super rare bike component or, or, or small bike brand, it's, it's very similar. <laughs> I, it, absolutely. And, and then once you, you know, you'll, once you get the birds down, you'll, you'll, you'll be like, how about salamanders? How about <laughs> dragonflies? You know, it'll like something will come up, you know, and you'll keep going for it. I remember yeah. I went to Belize, um, um, and I went to college late in life. This was my thirties, and I went down, down there um, as part of a college trip um, for tropical marine biology. And I treated it like birding. And the people at the marine center hadn't seen anybody do that before. And I was like, I want to see a hundred species of fish. And they're like, <laughs> I don't even know that's possible. <laughs> and then I just started like. I got like 120 some and it, 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 it treated like birding and it was, it was phenomenal. And then everybody else got in and they'll be like, yo, there's a, there's a queen angel fish over there. Go get it. And I'm like, you know, so <laughs> it, it, you could apply it to everything, you know? And, and I mean, they actually in world war two, the uh, Roger story Peterson, who wrote the first, you know, major field guide, he taught, um, they helped um, come up with guides for fighter pilots and, and, uh, and art, uh, you know, artillery, uh, you know, air, anti-air artillery to identify enemy planes. Using right, the, the right. Birding techniques, so it's applicable. Yeah, I, yeah. I was watching uh, Jason Ward did the episode where he went down to L.A. Uh, and hung out with some uh, plane spotters, and they were talking about the winglets on the plane and like the distinct markings and even the the specific sounds different uh, planes make. So nice. <laughs> definitely a lot of overlap. Okay, yeah. so it looks like that we've got uh, some some birders in here, like for. For those that are just getting into it, like what's, you know, what's the, a good starter set of, of uh, binoculars? Well, what, what things would you recommend? So I, I would recommend, you can't go wrong. Um, if you're, you know, you can't go wrong with Nikon or Vortex, right? I think you have both, right? You have Nikon or Vortex. When in doubt, whatever is in your price range in Nikon or Vortex, um, Highly recommend it. You know, obviously, if you want to get Swarovski, Koa, Steiner, Zeiss, like a have at it. You know, uh, but right. you know, you can't go wrong with. But I would say get an eight or ten power. It don't get. Uh, you can actually do less um, if you want, like six or seven. Um, but generally, I'd say eight to ten. You don't want to go more because the mag. The higher you get magnification, it magnifies everything, including the shake of your hand. And mm -hmm. then, and once, and also, your field of view gets narrower. So generally the rule of thumb is out. A lot of people out East tend to use eights because our forests are um, denser and shadier and they tend to use tens out West because everything is more spread out. So your chances you'll see something farther away. You know, out East when you're chasing a warbler from branch to branch to branch, you know, you it's uh, nice to have a wide field of view. It's nice to get more, more light. But even out here, a lot of people use tens. So yeah. I, I think 10 is probably the most common, but I think it's, I think in my opinion, I think eights are, are better, but you know, teach their own. I mean, I have both. I have tons of yeah. binoculars. Yeah. So one of the comments said that after I posted the, the binocular review is, uh, you know, monoculars do like, how is a monocular different from a spotting scope? 
Well, or are they essentially the same thing, but one's on the tripod. <laughs> you you don't want to mess with monoculars if you can avoid it. Um, really? They're, okay. they're so they're so hard to. Um, you almost end up having to use two hands anyway. <laughs> uh, you know, other um, so you might as well. I mean, they're not as bulky. I guess it's easier to keep around, but you end up having to use, you know, um, two hands anyway. So you might as well get a small pair of binoculars. It's always going to be better. So, mm-hmm. and, but as in a spotting scope, um, you get a much, you know, here's mine here, the, uh, this Koa, um, you, you know, you have, um, they get up to, you know, 60, 70 power. Um, I actually use it. I keep a 30 fixed on it. Cause I don't really, because once, even with a spotting scope, when you get over, you know, when you get in high magnifications, you you lose so much detail and light. So, but the idea is, you're never going to be able to hold something over 12, 15 power, remotely stable, um, right? And even ten over ten is, you know, ten's about your limit, really. Um, so, you, this is for if you're looking at ducks out, you know, or a. Uh, um, shorebirds far away although people in the tropics use them to look at things high in the canopy but generally you know they're not they're stationary you know um it, it's really difficult to find something you know moving in, the, in a spotting scope but i highly recommend getting a spotting scope a lot of people will try to make that next jump up they'll get like nikons or vortex and then they'll be like i think it's more a status thing they want to get their zeiss or Swarovskis or Leicas, and then they'll end up buying those before they buy a spotting scope and and you know, a spotting scope you can get for a few hundred dollars is going to give you more capacity um, hmm. than than the binoc- than an than a expensive pair of binoculars. You know, so mm-hmm. I, I highly recommend you know get a spotting scope before you get um, you know before you uh, get the, uh, the baller b- binoculars. <laughs> yeah, and, but you know what? Like, you know, I you know your channel is all about um, you celebrate the 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 high quality mid mid range product, and I'm a huge fan of that too. Right? I yeah. like. Um, you know, I'm a huge fan of salsa and I like Nikons. I mean, I have Steiners and Zeiss and Leica, but I've also been doing this for so long and some of them I got for free. Some of them mm-hmm. I, you know, spent a little bit of splurge on. I like, you know, I, 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 I shoot guns. I like, you know, a good Remington, and a good Savage, you know, I mm-hmm. like um, watches. I like a good Seiko, you know, right. so like, and they're, they're the, the difference between a good Nikon and a Swarovski is, is like this, right? And like, <laughs> and like, uh, you know, I'll, I'll use a scale for the TV. It's like, it's like <laughs> this, it's this, you notice it, but the difference between like a hundred, you know, like your, your bargain binoculars and an and Nikon is like, is like this. So you really only right. get like this much for that much money. You might as well, right. you know, <laughs> it, you know, do it. And like, it's worth it. If you have it great. But like, you can also go to Panama. Right, and see 300 <laughs> some birds you've never seen before you can go to um you know you can you can buy a bike to take you you know to <laughs> to do some carbon footprint you know some carbon free birding you could you know buy a kayak use a lot you could buy for that you know or like said a scope so you know yeah. I, I think it's more status than anything else frankly i mean there is a bit of a difference and you know all things being equal would it be nice to have them sure but you don't really you know a good yeah. two three hundred dollar pair of binoculars will suit really, really well yeah, I like finding that 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 the point of diminishing returns where it really like falls off, like you know the, the how much quality you gain from the, the amount of money. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, when we uh, when I bought the Vortex, I went to REI and they were pretty much cleaned out. You know, it's like in in during COVID, so there wasn't too much to compare with. But I compared the those with the Monarch fives that they had, and the Vortex, you know, had it cost less and had a wider field of view. Um, so that what sold me on that, uh, but a little bit heavy on the bike. So I started doing some research, and it, it seemed as if like the, you know, the, the Nikon Monarch Sevens and eight by thirties hit that that price that the nice sweet spot of of quality and and compactness. And I feel like they're actually as bright as the the Vortex, even though they've got a smaller objective lens. It's just well, you know, this, good... they could put money in the coatings. You know, it depends. Yeah. You know, that's that's. That's something too, you know. It's a. Uh, um, that's why you don't really lose too much. Get down to a, you know, a, th- a thirty millimeter lens to a forty anymore because it, the coatings are so good. It, you know, it's it's you, the light pans mission is really good these days. Yeah, it's it was uh like I I, th- I 
I felt like there would be a little bit of a difference, but I was actually shocked. Like once I had it in hand, uh, there was just less like kind of purple fringing. Um, yeah. And then like backlight, backlit situations, you could still kind of pick out detail in color where it was kind of a little bit mushier um, in the vortex. Um, not not to say that it's bad, but it, it was it was noticeable. Yeah. And you know, I've, I've been a photographer for over like 20 years. So like I, so I'm super into optics. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, now you're, what are you, you putting them in a bag and then bringing them out? What's your strategy that, to carrying them? Yeah. Still experimenting. Um, I've been, I've been putting them in the soft case that they come, come in and like in a, in a saddle bag or, or a handlebar bag. Um, do you have any tips? And I got, I got tips and I got props. <laughs> okay. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, ghost cat bags. Uh, in fact, Josh from ghost cat bags, he's, um, um, the mechanic on my team. He's not a competitive member, but he'll fix the bikes when they, uh, when, when, you know, we'll, what I'll do is I'll, uh, if we break, really break down, but it happens occasionally. And like, a, I get a flat, I hand him my bike. I ride right. his to the next <laughs> stop. He fixes it meets me there. Um, uh, but he makes a binocular bag, like specifically oh, wow. old binoculars. I mean, nice. you could use them for anything, but you know they're they're sized perfectly, and um, it uh, goes on also, the handlebar or on the on the handlebar, yeah, yeah. And so that's great. So you stop real quick and pull them right out, and it's great. And this is um so Ghost Cat bags, um, all the his products are named after uh, someone's dead cat, you know, like like you know someone's <laughs> pet, and these are the Lolas, so they're named after nice. my old cat Lola. So <laughs> nice. And um, but the other thing I really like is borrowed from hunting is the um um the chest chest like a chest bag or something yeah these chest rigs okay and they're i got um so they hold the binocular really tight to your chest and so you can just pull them out and you can even leave them out you don't have to put them in but you, you know but when you ride they hold them really really tight to your chest so they don't flop all over and they're all just available. And what I tend to do is, you know, I, I'll put like, sometimes in a world series, I'll just wear the light crap. I won't even wear shorts over top of them. Cause I'm out, you know, 24, right. almost 24 hours. And so I need somewhere to put my, you know, wallet and you can have, um, you can, there's a pouch you can put here. Ah, okay. um, but what I, and what I tend to put in it actually is like, I got, um, I have a tourniquet and, uh, <laughs> some, some, um, some first aid stuff. You know? How often have you used a tourniquet while you're reverting? Does that come up? Come up pretty often. <laughs> it doesn't. But if I get, if I get, um, you know, if uh, me or somebody else gets hit in a bad car, it gets gets ran over by a car. <laughs> that's you know, true. that's that's the you know, <laughs> that's the um, that's the thing. You know, we, everybody always carries a boo boo. You know, often you carry a boo boo kit, but a boo boo. Right. You know, you're gonna. It's, like you're gonna go home and shower and avoid that infection, right? Right. You know, at the end of the day, but if you don't, if you're not able to stop bleeding, um, right? You know, you're not gonna. <laughs> so I tend to always carry a tourniquet and a pressure bandage because you just never, you know, if you get in an accident, you it could really save someone's life. And you never right. know, you know, um, not to be morbid, yeah. but uh, if you put my wallet <laughs> or you know, I'm asthmatic. I can put my inhaler in there. Right. So, so I highly. So just, curious, how how sensitive are binoculars to vibration like would you is it a good idea to to pat it or is are they pretty optics pretty stable inside the binocular that you don't have to worry about it too much uh i mean th these days you can a lot of these um binoculars you can you can you know drop them a few times and, and they won't even you know go out of alignment they're really sturdy these days okay so I, I don't think that's an issue at all Okay, so. that's good to know. I used to shoot Leica, and it was like a rangefinder, and you know, a couple hard dings, and like the rangefinders misaligned. So I didn't didn't quite know like what the what the situation was with, with binoculars. <laughs> hmm. it's, yeah, I guess it's more electronics than range rangefinder, but I mean, they make them for hunting, so you would think that you know. Right, right. They get used to the uh, banged around. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So, do you guys have any questions for Tony? Any general burning questions? Let us know. Um, also, let us know where you're watching from. Um, so Andy, again, how often do you photograph birds or is that a whole, is that like a whole different group of birders? So, um, my camera's over there. I got, I just started to, to, to get a new, I got like a, but I also got it for the podcast. So I got a Sony a seven, um, okay. um, you know, used and I got, you know, a um, like a 300 millimeter lens for it. Um, so I, um, 
I'd say most birders, by the time they reach a certain point, will the next natural step is to invest in a lot of camera gear. Um, so I'll say most birders, you know, take, but, uh, um, there's a lot of people who get into birding via photography. So a lot mm -hmm. of birders turn into photographers and a lot of photographers turn into birders, but it's also neat. I know, I know people that I, I would guess I call them birders, but they don't even have binoculars. They just use their camera and then they look at, you know, so that's, um, uh, so I think I'm kind of, for someone who's been birding as long as I have, I think I'm kind of, unusual that photography is not that um uh, major of a focus for me it's uh i just was like well i should get a camera for you know i want to have a youtube eventually have a youtube component um we have a little bit of one but i want to have one for the podcast but i also want you know content um to put on social media so i figured i should get one and then the, because i started doing that really it, it's it's it does hook you quick so um right. the classic and these is another hobby to spend thousands <laughs> and photography is unbelievable that's strange. expensive <laughs> especially yeah. like the the kind of lenses that you need uh to get that kind of reach get get super spendy really quickly <laughs> yeah and I, I think that's there's a i don't think um I, I think you can justify the money much easier with photography than even on a bike or a uh a, a, a binoculars i think that, that it really is the money does make a difference in photography so yeah yeah um, but a lot of people people you say you should carry a camera at least a little, little point and shoot or like a little like kind of rebel or something just for documentation in case you see something because that back in the day you used to be able to be like yeah i saw this and they and you write notes and they accept it and they'd be in a records committee now people are like well, this is a photograph you didn't see it and you're like <laughs> well, I mean, I clearly saw that and they're like nope you got to document it so um yeah let's see so brian here has a question uh, do you keep track of all the birds you have seen and identified, write them down in the book or, or cross them off a, a list? Like what's your, what's your so, tracking strategy? Does e eBird, do you do eBird yet? Uh, I don't know. I was going to, that was one of the other questions. It's like what birding apps should one have? Well, e everybody should get eBird and just okay. put your settings in the eBird. I'm bad at it, which is funny because I'm a very early adopter of eBird. Um, <laughs> I was, you know, but I'm, I like to, I don't like to, um, do paperwork or do data entry. I like the bird, but most people really, they really like um, documenting your settings and it really um, to the point where like, they'll give you a shit if you don't, you know? So, right. um, but eBird does it for you. So just do put it in e eBird, you know? And, okay. and so um, I got some like, I can just maybe show you like, Like, I'm really bad at notes, and I travel all around the world. I was in a, I was in a punk band toward the world, and and like so like my, you know, like uh, you know I just write down like what I saw and then, and, but a lot of times oh, where's that one like it'll just be like yeah I mean it's like <laughs> I mean I just wrote like that like sometimes I used to write down just the the new birds. <laughs> that I saw that day and not like every bird I saw and like, and you didn't think it was a big deal. And then the next thing you know, they start splitting. So when I toured Asia with the band, um, I would see, I would just write the new birds. So, right. and I would take, a, but, um, the same leaf bird, like literally, I mean, like with Jedron's leaf bird or whatever that you, that these used to think was one species in Thailand and Sri Lanka are now two species. Hmm. Right. So like, it's really important to take good notes because, you know, you can get what they call an armchair tick where like you suddenly because you documented a bird in one country and, and, and the same bird in another country just by, you know, is now two different species and you get an extra species on your list. And like I have friends that work in a taxonomy and, and they've realized that like one species is now, I mean, I think this is an ant, uh, an ant pitted down in South America. That's now 19 species. It used to you know, be one. Huh. So if you saw that in, if you have a document where what mountain range you're in, what country you're in, now you have a whole bunch. So it is important to keep lists. And so, but for me, I only care about two lists. I care about my world list and I care about Philadelphia list. Mm -hmm. Just because that's the only, you know, I only care about what I see in my own city and what I see in the world. But a lot of people have it the county. They have oh, I, my yard list. I'm starting to work on my yard list a bit now that I own a house. But before I didn't really care. <laughs> but now, but like now people, but so people get real specific and it's like every year, you know, they'll have multiple lists per year per, you know, their, 
multiple counties, states, world, right. country. You know, and it, it's great because um, it makes when you put an artificial limitation on it, then everything you see in there gets more exciting. So, you know, could I go down the, I could, you know, in Philadelphia, we're very close to the coast, but it's a different state, right? Like, right. Even though like I could get to most parts of, of New Jersey quicker than more than half of Pennsylvania, it's a different state at the coast. So like, I get excited. I'm like, Oh, I see a, you know, in Philadelphia after a hurricane, I could see some, uh, some of these, you know, turns and, and goals and shorebirds are blown inland and they're new to my mm-hmm. Philadelphia list. And, but I could have just driven an hour and saw them all <laughs> like it was nothing, you know? So it's, it right. makes it, it does make it a lot of fun. You know, that's a good idea. I should we like, there's like a, a block of like natural area that they go to, to fish and bird. I should start like a, just like the back backyard list. They, they call uh, yeah, your that's, that would be your patch. Okay. Right. You have your, your yard list. We also have your patch and that's like your spot, you know? And like you're like you, you know, in a a lot of people do that. They have their patch. It's a be a patch list, and you can put a patch list in the eBird. Right. So what's how many species have you spot? What's your, how many species in in your city list? It's two sixty seven. Okay. Cool. Yeah, and like it's just over the there's like three hundred twenty some that have been seen ever, and the highest I'm on eBird. I'm the sixth, I think, highest list in Philly, and and everybody who's older than me, <laughs> who's, who's <laughs> higher than me, um, but uh, there's some people that are really uh, um, going nuts, and they'll probably overtake me uh, within a couple of years. But uh, I think uh, the highest is like 302 for any one person in Philadelphia. Cool. So, so what other like uh, what I'm starting to discover is like birthing has its own kind of subculture and language. Like, what are some kind of vocabulary terms that their birders use that maybe others outside of birding would not understand. Um, if you don't see a bird, you dipped on it. Hmm. Right. <laughs> um, so you'd be like, ah, I, did, did you go for the, you know, did you go for the sib and sab, sabin's gold down in uh, Delaware? You're like, nah, I dipped, you know, so you dip, <laughs> uh, twitcher is like a bridge thing was getting more common. So if you're really in the, um, I feel like, Back in the day, I thought there were. I believe you, you, there were bird there were bird watchers and birders, and the birders were more about listers. But nowadays, everybody who likes birds is a birder. And then, if you really in a listing, you're a twitcher, which is a British uh, term, okay. but it's become more popular here. Um, right. What would it be? So, I use them so I'm so immersed in. I use it so often. I'm trying to think what would be like a, you know, someone a lifer, that... stringers, <laughs> stringers. Yes. So someone who, um, um either is outright lying or more likely <laughs> is like, um, um, I'm trying to think of a good example of like Western sandpiper and, uh, semi palmated sandpiper are pretty similar looking, right. Um, mm-hmm. some, some fine details. So maybe you don't, you said you saw what you, you might've thought you saw a semi palmated sandpiper with a particularly thin bill. And you're like, it was a Western. And then like, <laughs> I, and, and that, um, that's a stringer. They like, they, they wishful thinking gets the better of them. Gotcha. You know? <laughs> uh, cool. So we got Twitcher, dip, stringer. Oh, well, there's a term too. That's kind of cool. Um, the, uh, picnic table effect or huh. the, uh, specifically the Patagonia picnic table effect. So that's <laughs> a term. Um, when, so in Arizona, pa- Patagonia, Arizona, not South America, Patagonia, okay. Arizona, which is right before you get, oh, I think it's what highway is that? Right before you drive down, there's Nogales, and you get into Mexico. There's this rest stop, and there was a picnic table there. And someone stopped there and saw a, a rose thread of Bacard uh, building a nest. And that's a Central American bird. Um, it reaches, you know, doesn't quite make it to North America. Oh, well, I mean, depends on how you define North America. It doesn't quite make it into the United States. And mm-hmm. so they were like, oh, they saw that and they let people know. And then people came down there and they saw like a violet cotton hummingbird and gray hawk and <laughs> all these other birds. And bec- the idea is like because one bird brought a lot of eyes to the to the t- to to the table, pick the table. Right. Um <laughs> they found other things. So it's a thing that happens a lot where like you see, you know, um it's, it's, I think it's kind of a cool term. I'm trying to think of right. anything off. T- Cool. Yeah, we know uh, Patagonia. We, sp- we did a couple of bike rides there. We're actually going to spend more time until like COVID happened. But um, yeah, that's cool. 
cool. It's an incredible place. Yeah. 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 Let's see. Uh, so someone asked, uh, do you go to Heinz Park? That in your yeah. Head? In fact, I lived there for 13 months. I was uh, did a miracle Vista and I lived there. So um, I grew up calling it Tinicum, which is the Lenny Lenape word for marsh. And it was mm-hmm. uh, Tinicum um, Nature Reserve. And then the, it was federally, they changed the name to John Hines National Wildlife Refuge at Tinicum after uh, Senator John Hines died in a tragic plane crash nearby in the uh, named refuge after after him. Gotcha. So Yeehaw says spark birds and pitching. What's so pitching? So spark bird is, is the first, My the kingfisher is my spark bird. Like the bird, okay. you, dipper is probably your spark bird. <laughs> Maybe you went there, saw Dipper, and a, the, you know, so you gotta get Dipper tattoo. Um, although it's all gray, it's kind of not the, maybe the best tattoo. But, um, so pishing is letting to go, and that um, it mimics the uh, scold call. So a lot of birds um, think about like um, like a B fifty two bomber is not particularly um, maneuverable, but it could, it, it can't you know outmaneuver you know, a fighter jet, right? But it could bomb an entire airfield of fighter jets if it wanted to, right? But right. the fighter jets are more, but if the fighter jets see it before, it can, it, it'll like harass them or you shoot it down or whatever. I mean, right. so these small birds, I'm not saying they're going to shoot down the hawk or the owl or whatever, but right. the idea is if these ambush predators get spotted by a um, small bird, they will um, harass it uh, okay. because it, they know it can't get it because it's, it you know it lost the element of surprise, so they'll right. they'll harass it, and the noise is always sounds like psh, 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 a lot of the time, especially in uh, um, uh, tit mice and chickadees and and whatnot. So if you make that noise, other birds will pop out, being like, "What do you, who? What do you see?" You know, so that way you could bring birds out. Yeah. So. All right. Cool. Um, so I've noticed something when I go to uh, the patch here. And that is, I, I feel like the the calls change like the closer I get to the birds. Is that a thing, or am I just imagining that? Like, like do they. Uh, well, like, I, I feel mean, like. This, yeah, definitely. Like for instance, um, morning doves, they, they kind of go, hoo, 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 hoo. and then like yellow book cuckoos kind of go like, hoo, hoo, hoo. and at a distance, you lose part of the morning dove call, and. And often trick you to think you're hearing a yellow cuckoo. So like the other day, like I heard what I thought was the yellow cuckoo from my house. I live uh right, I live like literally like the third house in from the trail in the Woods of Hick. And if you're familiar with Philly, it's this massive park. And um, so I from my house I heard it and then I rushed down there to, and then it was just a morning dove when I got close enough. So <laughs> sometimes you you know, like uh I was a little bit right. of a Doppler effect or whatnot. And by the way, I missed you at the uh Bike Actually, Expo. Bike Expo. Yeah. Yeah, because I was giving away trees that day. I was so bummed. I was like, why couldn't you be doing it on Saturday? <laughs> so. Yeah. Uh, so Brian asks, is there a bucket list of birds you haven't seen yet? Yeah, well, I've seen just shy of 2,000. And so the, I, my bucket list is, is 8,000, <laughs> some 200, 8,000, you know, some birds. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, like, um, um, is there any, any in particular that you, you know, if you could could see right away, like what are the the ones that you've been dying to see but haven't, you know, had a chance? Um, I'd really, well, there's kind of two ways to look at that. There's like birds you've never, like, I'd love to see a, a emperor penguin, you know, right. but I've never been to Antarctica. But the stuff like I've been to Brazil three times and somehow I missed um, saffron toucanet every time, which is like a not an uncommon bird. So, like, that bird, like, burns in my I'm like how did i miss the saffron toucanet and i really want to see that but yet like you know um i could so i want to go back to brazil to see one bird right um, and then maybe if we went back to brazil i and saw i probably see a handful of other things right but i could go to new guinea and see you know several hundred birds so right. you know i really want to see um um i really want to see a palace fish eagle i um i want to see an ibis bill I want a torrent duck. I've been to South America several times. I've not seen torrent duck, which is crazy. Um, I want to see, um, I think I said, I was, I want to see a uh, crab plover, um, hypercolis, um, Eleanor's falcon comes to mind. Uh, Lammer Geyer would be a bird. I really would like to see, um, mm-hmm. trying to think, you know, there's, there's quite a few, and, you know, obviously I've, I've seen like three species. There's three. Uh, yeah. I think I see three species of bird of paradise in Australia. 
Um, but I like to go to New Guinea and see, you know, a couple dozen. All of right. Them. So. Right. Cool. Um, so when you, when you talk to someone that's not into, to birthing, how do you, how do you explain the, the hobby to them? <laughs> it, you know, like, I've said before how there's like enough to be a challenge, but not enough that it's, uh, overwhelming and that the, the, you know, the, the fact that you could, you could see a bird, you know, like there's been like a goal should be no closer than South America showed up a Coney Island. Like that, the element of like randomness really is mm-hmm. exciting. And, and so because of that, you could, it, you always have, you're always a little bit afraid of FOMO, you know? <laughs> and like, so like it, it can get you out anytime because even though you're like, well, it's the same piece of, you know, same park you go to all the time. Like you never know right. something can always show mm-hmm. up there. So like, that's, you know, that's kind of the allure and it's like, um, but it's the great excuse because you see other things, you know. Um, right. You know, how, you don't just always see birds. You know, you have, you go out, you might see, you know, like a the other day. Well, I was bike birding, but I saw a mink, mm-hmm. in you know, around the corner from my house. It was awesome, you know. And you could, you know, went south of I went to Brazil, but I saw a jaguar when I was down there, you know. So like, <laughs> nice. it gets you out there. You never, you know. Yeah, I, I feel like my my general awareness of my surroundings has increased since I've gone in into birding. You know, I'm yeah. always just looking at the trees, like any sign of movement. Whereas before, I just might be zoning out on the bike ride. Now, you know, when I hear something or, or see something in the corner of my eye, you know, it just makes you more aware. What's interesting is, so like I said, I live right next to the Wissahickon. So I use the Wissahickon um, as a birder, as a mountain biker, and just to like take exercise hikes. And with COVID, it's been kind of crazy because people are really in a park so much. But let me ask you a question. When what does on your left mean? Uh, that means that as a cyclist, you're going to pass someone on their left side, and right? When does on your left mean move <laughs> off the trail so I don't have to slow down? Because that's uh, as a bir- <laughs> because as a birder who's walking there, you know, trying to see some warblers in May, that's what on your left means. It doesn't mean <laughs> hey, I'm coming, it's it's get out of my way so I don't slow down. Right, so that, right. It, like, but it's interesting being a birder and a biker. Um, it's really, you know, it's interesting to see um, the um, the trail rage of not. But luckily, <laughs> I'm a big guy, so they're not really trying to tangle with me generally. Right. Um, when I yell back at them, but like um, when I yell, you know, but like it's kind of, you know, um, you really see some bad behavior with cyclists when you're out on the trail for a different purpose. Right. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> Yeah, I, um, I, I I run also. So like, there's there's been times when you know I, I don't run with headphones, but like still, sometimes they get passed very closely. So <laughs> um, one thing I make you aware of that exists um, is um, mini scopes. Okay. Yeah. So this is a Nikon ED50. Um, that, that still looks pretty big though for a mini scope. I have to tell you. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 you know it could it could fit you know mm-hmm. in this bag, and I put I I put them in my frame. I put them um, in my handlebar bags, like the roll, like the Revelate roll bag, no problem with the okay. tripod, you know, yeah. with a small tripod. Um, and like uh, this is a a Koa, but this is a full size Koa. Um, but they make uh their uh, TSN eight eight three uh wait five five three. So Koa makes. It's it cost fifteen hundred dollars, but I tell you what, it's the optics are so phenomenal. Like, uh, so if you're, you can often get a, this Nikon's about six seven hundred, uh, but Vortex makes some that are only a couple hundred. Optocron as well. I tell you what, sometimes these mini scopes, like, they'll do you almost just as good as the big one for shorebirds and ducks, and then you can take them cycling. So, I highly recommend like people it's a good way to get into a spotting scope that you can also take birding so that's like are those uh are those like a, a fixed fixed lens or do they have like a zoom or they have those... a zoom yeah, yeah they have a zoom uh, you can get a fixed um but uh you know i um that one just happened i got i, bu- I bought a second hand and happened to have a, a zoom on it uh, although yeah. for my big one i actually they didn't make koa now makes a wide angle zoom but, but when i forgot the scope 10 years ago they didn't so, and I really like a wide field of view. So I, I yeah. got 30 and I, I never miss, I don't miss it. Um, even out my friends that have a, a, uh, a zoom, I'd attend. I really like the wide field of view. 30 fixed. I think is great. Yeah. 
Um, so our friend Andy asked, uh, top five desert island birds. If you're stuck on a desert island and there could only be five birds there, <laughs> what would they be and why? Um, I would say um, marvelous spatula tail, which is this hummingbird that has this really long, this tail is like three times like his body and it ends in these two like iridescent blue heart sh- arch, which I've seen in Peru. Um, spectacular parasitic Jaeger. And Jaegers are essentially like, they look like goals that are like kind of turned into hawks and they unbelievably aerobatic. Um, Peregrine Falcon, because it's a classic, you can't argue with it. Mm-hmm. Canada Goose, because they got so much personality. <laughs> and um, uh, Belt of Kingfisher, I'd say that's my right. <laughs> nice. Um, so Yeehaw asks, uh, any thoughts on doing a bike big day? Like well, what would I mean, that the entail? World- well, the, well, the world, be the world series. series. Yeah, the world okay. series, and I've done a Philadelphia uh, bike big day as well. So, okay, um, yeah. So, like, um, I've I've done you know eleven or twelve of them at this point, uh, and they're and it's great. Um, so, yeah, um, Philadelphia, we got one hundred and three, and my friends the same day did it in a car. They got one hundred and thirteen. So, <laughs> didn't do too shabby to be behind, you know, um, not having a car, you know, because they can you know they can just go back and forth to hit the ties at the right spot, you know. Um, right. But, you know, in a uh, cycling, you know, um, it's uh, we've gotten what, like 150 some in a day on biking. And I know people some have gotten 160 some, um, you know, so you, you definitely go like if you wanted to. I I really would like to go to Ecuador, Peru, Colombia. And um, I mean, I've been to Peru and Ecuador before, but that's the biodiversity hotspot in the world for birds is the tropical Andes. Hmm. And so if you, if I was to start the day, the top of the mountain and then just ride down, <laughs> uh, you know, if, um, you could get uh, several hundred species of bird, especially if you know the songs. Oh, so, dang. Nice. Yeah. Um, so here's a question. If like, so there, there are all these kind of formal or informal uh, birthing competitions. Is there one website where people log in to participate or how like no it's all um i mean the they all re, re, like are they kind of just run by regional groups or regional regional, regional groups um so okay. the i think the off the top of my head the three the number i mean obviously the world series of birding and that's by the new jersey audubon and kate may bird observatory kate may bird observatory is part of new jersey audubon and new jersey audubon is separate from national audubon so um audubon um when national Audubon, st- you know, they, not every chapter, not every local Audubon joined national Audubon. So there are some like New Jersey and mass um, and mm-hmm. a few others that are still separate. Um, so New Jersey Audubon does world series of birding. Uh, there's the um, champions of the flyway in Israel. And that's incredible. And, and um, I would love to do that once a day. And there's a, I guess the Texas, Texas classic, which is a week long in April. Um, so, um, and there's other ones, you know, there's plenty of other ones, but those are the three, I would say off the top of my head, the biggest ones and they all, it's all for charity. It's all, you know, you, it's like, do, it's like running for breast cancer or whatever, Every, you know, they, right. they, they, um, pledge either, you know, set amount or per mile, but you know, in this case per bird and it all goes to, you know, wildlife conservation, bird conservation and education. So, oh, yeah, cool. Uh, well, before we wrap it up, uh, I wanted to get to this earlier, but we'll do it at the end. Uh, tell us about uh, one. <laughs> yeah, so the Wildlife Ob- Observer Network. Um, mm-hmm. At one point, we called it Observation Network, but I thought it would sound better observer, so it might still be <laughs> out there as observation. But Wildlife Observer Network, um, I wanted to – uh, so Taki and I kind of came up with the idea um, – we want to do a podcast. We would, we wanted, I've been doing the urban wildlife podcast with my friend, Billy Brown for five years and the wildlife, um, the urban wildlife podcast is, is really, you know, it's, I love that podcast. It's great, but we realized that it was a niche within a niche, right? It's like <laughs> narrowed to people like wildlife, narrowed to people who like wildlife in cities. Right. <laughs> so the idea was um, let's broaden our scope. Uh, so it's, you know, all kinds of content. It's not just, so there's a bunch of different theme podcasts um, that are come to you all one feed right now. If they all, and we might separate them out later, but right now, so it's a, a podcast feed. 
Uh, we do have a YouTube channel. There's not that much on there because we're not really, you know, um, we're hoping to get into that more. We have some of our uh, packets on there. We have some short little funny videos. And then there's like a website with a blog. But the main thing we do right now is, is podcasts. And so okay. we have the Herb Wally podcast. We have uh, Brothers of Birding, which is me, Tech Key. We have From Bouncers to Birders, which is me and my friend Mike McGraw. We literally used to be both used to be bouncers and, <laughs> and you know, at night and like birders by day. So um, there's um, On the Wing, which is like about ecotourism. I do that with my wife, um, Angie. And there's um, Herpin Ain't Easy, which is you know about herpetology. <laughs> there's Nature's Hype Man, which is just about general love of, of nature. That's with my, my buddy Robin Erzari. Um, and, and we have like, you know, we have a lot more to come, like, um, my friend Kate Gershinsky and Katrina Rakowski, these incredible wildlife artists that are going to be doing some content and talking about art. So we have a lot more, but right now we have about like these 10 or so themed podcasts at all one. Right. We have, a uh, the biology of, of, of fan, uh, sci-fi fantasy, which we've done a couple episodes, but COVID has been difficult. You know, as you can see, a lot of people don't have the. Um, they would come to my house and record in the studio, but now they can't because right, they might right. not have the means at home to do it, you know. So, right. Do you feel like, uh, do you have any sense if because of COVID, people are getting into birthing more because it's something that they can do in their backyard? Um, definitely. Well, let's give a shout out to my really good friend Ed Williams in Melbourne or Melbourne, Australia. He has a bird the feck at home. Um, and that's this hugely popular Facebook group. And the idea is just to like bird within the the confines of being COVID responsible. Uh, and he just lives in like a uh, a small ha- a house with like barely in a yard. And he started right. it. It's funny because some p- people are complaining to him. They're like, "You have people on here that are like field researchers or like <laughs> you know like tour guides that live in the lodge." I mean, that's not fair. And he's like, "But I live in." You know, like a <laughs> yeah in in the city, and I, I I've seen like thirty species from my yard. It's like, you know, it's all like um, so that celebrates you know backyard birding and what you could see. And I and I definitely think people have gotten into it from that. Um, just in general, the parks. I mean, Philadelphia, our park system is overwhelmed with visitors, and so I I, I would think that there are more as um. And, you know, you can still get binoculars and books and whatnot. So it's my sense, but I would like to see numbers. I mean, as a scientist, I would like to, to know. Um, right. Those numbers. I, know, I know we were uh, at a kind of related, but we, we were we went on a fishing trip a couple of weeks ago. We stopped by the 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 fly shop just to get some intel. And I was trying to buy like a really basic tool, like just some nippers. Right. So I can cut the tippet. And he's like, oh, we're all sold out. Like in, in chatting with him, you know, like fly fishing's having, you know, a moment with a lot of, a lot of people because like kids, kids team sports are out. So, so dads are taking their, their kids fishing again and all their beginner sets were, were sold out. So it seems like a, a good opportunity for, for more outdoor activities like fishing and, yeah. and, and cycling and birthing. Yeah, well, I've, heard, I've heard a lot of bike shops are uh, that low yeah, in stock. Sold well, out. <laughs> you know, we haven't talked that much about the bikes and I know oh, we're yeah. short on time. But <laughs> the one thing I'm curious about is I believe the greatest, if you're going to pick one bike for bike birding, it's the Salsa Fargo. Okay. And why have you not done a Salsa Fargo uh, (laughs) review yet? That's the OG, right? Is it the Fargo? Yeah, that's the only drop bar Salsa bike that I've not tested. (laughs) And I mean, that predates the Warbird. I have both, but that's it predates the Warbird. Wasn't that like the first kind of like super Mm all-rounder, like, you know, and like... to me, the Fargo is, I mean, I often will grab the, that over my, you know, I, I have a muck luck and I have a stump jumper. And when I want to ride the trails, I often ride my, 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 my Fargo and I use it for right. commuting. It's to me, it's the greatest single, you, you can do anything on it. And now they make these wider bars. I'm going to get some of those. Yeah. Um, put on, <laughs> it's like, I don't even, it's the greatest single, you know? Yeah. Uh, I will. I will fill that gap, but probably next year. I think even salsa is like running out of the bikes to to send out. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately, I send you mine, but it won't fit. But right. I mean, the Jones Loop Bar, uh, the Jones bike, to me is. Uh, I look at that as like that seems to be a. Um, I would think that would be a really, really. I mean, the best bike for birding is any bike, right? Um, right. And I think if you're gonna like, if someone was gonna buy a bike for birding, yeah, I'd say I, I recommend a Fargo. But I think I think just a basic mountain bike. 
um, yeah. is probably, you know, your, the best cause you could do anything. Um, right. Uh, but I, I, you know, I think to me, the Fargo is, is clearly, um, you're upright, you know, I like, you know, my hands cramp, so I like the, the drop bars, but I think the Jones, uh, the Jones, uh, I have Jones loop bars on, on, on a Kona, um, um, Sutra old touring bike. Yeah. Um, but my, this, my, my hands still cramp on them, but I think that, but I'm really interested in the Jones bike, although the one I could afford would be, it's still pretty heavy. So, you know, the Fargo is, pretty is. Light. my Fargo is pretty light, uh, cause yeah. it's steel. So, yeah, that's the only thing, you know, I love, I love how the Jones bike handles. It is like, I mean, it's like 33 pounds. Um, so it's not the lightest, but that bad. <laughs> it's not that bad. Yeah. It's not thought, that bad, but, thought it was I, more, but yeah, I, I mean, I'd, I'd feel I'd like it more if it was like 28. <laughs> yeah. Which like I think my Fargo is exactly that 28. So yeah. Well, I, 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 yeah. So. Yeah. Cool. Well, we're coming up to our, uh, our, um, thank you, uh, for, for being a guest. Um, thank you guys in the, the chat for, for joining in today. And, uh, I'm going to put up your, I think I've got the right website here. This is it, right? Wildlife Observer yeah. Network.com. And you can find us on Spotify, um, Anchor, um, Overcast, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts. So, and, and we're yeah. like Wildlife Obs Network um, on Instagram. So, cool. Um, yeah. So, I'm going to take it home uh, from here. Uh, thanks again, Tony, for, for being a guest. Thank you guys for joining us in the chat, for sticking out, for hanging out for, for our. Uh, plus talking about bikes and birds remember next big thing you've, you've heard it here first next big thing um, we've got lots of fun uh, videos coming up uh, on the channel i can't think of them right now but there there's a bunch that are they're being filmed and being scheduled and um, thanks again tony and until next time guys keep the self-assigned